Um, and so I can actually uh, adjust the color map. A little bit of scrolling on this. Oh, okay. so, so right now it's actually just showing us a, a solid color. But if I go over to information panel, I know that uh, uh, this has a field called scalar, which is double, which has something to do with the velocity of, of, the, uh, of, of the earthquake uh, moving through there. So I want it to actually color by that field. Okay. And I'm going to ask it to show, you know, set the color map so it goes from that minimum value to the maximum value. But look at it, it still doesn't look like a lot going on. So this is where we, again, we have to, you know, before we uh, immediately assume, oh, there must have been something wrong with my, my data um, or, the, or the program, um, let's delve inside so we can bring up a slicer. Again, if I hit apply, and if I look there, if I squint real close, I can start to see, oh, there's some structures there. I can see these uh, uh, waves moving through this form. And in fact, if I take that and again apply that rescale data, now I start to see some stuff. So some, you know, you have to sometimes dig into your, to your data a little bit uh, to determine what's going on. We could also bring up um, ISO surfaces for this. And in the interest of time, the leave some opportunities for questions. Let me just jump ahead to um, Okay. So now I've actually gone and uh, I had to, you can sort of see this uh, this volume rendering here, which is a little better than the previous one. Um, actually, I should, I should be changing the background color. As well, but there's an option where you can change from that gray to a white. Um, fortunately, just thought of that too late, uh, so sorry, folks. Um, anyhow, um, and we had to actually do another trick here because this was curvilinear. It doesn't by default have the uh, volume mapping option there. It only does that for uh, regular rectilinear grids. So we actually did a test, uh, a step called tetrahedralize, where we uh, let me show you what that looks like. Where it does pretty much what you would have expected. Let me do that as uh, wireframe. So rather than being these rectangular blocks that were kind of curved in one dimension, now it's broken it up into uh, tetrahedron. And so there's a rendering technique that allows us to get a volumetric representation from that. So the the the, the lesson here is sometimes you're thinking, oh yeah, I'd like to see this as a volume rendering. And that's not an option, or or one of your features that you're going for is not there. Keep in mind that only some options are available for some data types, but there's frequently a way to transform the data from one type to another to let you get to the representation uh, that you want. So, um, actually, I wanted to show. Let me put this all together. This is a good one. I hope that comes out for the folks remotely. That gives you an idea of, of, of what they were what they were going for. And that's what they, what they use for the presentation mode in their publication. For that presentation form of visualization. So. So I wisely figured that everything would take longer than it did. Uh, so I just have a few quick slides on, on advanced features. Um, the client server setup, uh, if you actually want to, to do that, uh, look at, at PV server. There's a way you can uh, give a, a flag for MPI run that lets it uh, run across uh, multiple processes on your, uh, on your back end. Off-screen renderer is an option that allows it to actually transfer image data instead of, of geometric data. Uh, and just some note for some IU folks, I was not successful in getting to run from the server forward to the client, or excuse me, from the uh, client uh, back to the server. But they do have an option if you've got firewalls and such, where that could cause a problem um, uh, where the reverse connection did work. Take that with a grain of salt, because that could just be uh, part of my technology ignorance. Um, but that, that definitely does work, where the server calls up the client, and your client accepts that incoming connection. And, and you're off to the races. Other than that, it you know, it, 
it's not very exciting to show that here because it uh, it looks just like you're using it locally. Um, when you get really big data, things will start to uh, to slow down. And keep in mind a lot of the stuff that you see about running Paraview in parallel. We'll actually talk about data decomposition methods. One of the choices that you have to make is what makes the most sense for your data and what you're trying to do. Do you take your data, in this case uh, over there on the left, uh, some type of, of CFD uh, computation over the space shuttle, and do you divide up the various uh, parts of the grid, the geometry, and send those to different processors? Or do you divide things up in image space, as we're showing over there on the right, so everybody's got a copy of the same data, but they're, they're only rendering various parts of the screen for that particular time step. And so you, you'll either see these kind of and you'll see these multicolored images, and they're trying to show you how that's distributed over the various uh, nodes on the back end, or they'll do the same thing for the screen tiles as well. There's ways you can do batch animation. So if you've got a really big data set, but an option is to, is to decimate it, bring it down, kind of work through your visualization parameters, and then set up a batch file uh, where you can actually start it up and you can disconnect it, and it will continue to run uh, and, and drop out frames, or dump out frames through the file system. Uh, and then you can uh, uh, turn those into a movie. There's all kinds of options for scripting. You can bring up a shell. Uh, if, you're, if you like Python, uh, you can do a shell. You can do a programmable filter. Uh, one of the examples, I know I was going by fast, but it was using the uh, programmable Python filter. You can extend it by, by writing macros, plugins, custom filters. Uh, so the, the uh, sky's the limit, but I think the real key there uh, is that you know with some effort you'll be able to scale it up so that you won't always uh, be running into a problem of, wow, my data's too big, my, my computer's not fast enough, because uh, no matter what computer you get, you know, desktop computer or cave or tiled wall, you can always imagine a data set that's going to outstrip it. So having an intelligent uh, visualization package is a good thing. And there are others, Visit being one of them. So uh, 